Hello and welcome to Driver, the DW Car Show. Coming up, Mazda with a folding metal roof, the MX-5 RF. BMW with hybrid power, the 530e. Plus, the new Audi RS5. Aus und vorbei. The new Audi RS5 now has just six cylinders instead of eight, explains our carman Reinhold. So what else is new? Well, the previous naturally aspirated engine has been ditched in favor of a twin turbocharged unit. Seem familiar? Yes, from Audi's VW sister brand Porsche for better performance and better economy. But enough talking. Let's get out on the road. The elegant two-door RS5 is the first Audi performance model to feature the new design vocabulary. The big single-frame radiator grille is still there, although it's wider and flatter than in the entry-level model. At the back, the RS5 has the typical oval exhaust outlets. Weighing in at 1,655 kilograms, the new coupe is around 60 kilos heavier than its predecessor. It has pretensions of being a sporty Gran Turismo and a car you can comfortably cover long distances in, too. Vinyl is impressed with the suspension and not just in the super hard sports setting, but in the comfort mode too. You certainly can use the RS5 as a Gran Turismo with plenty of space for passengers and cargo. The new V6 engine delivers spontaneous response and masses of torque. It develops 600 newton meters of output at 1,900 to 5,000 revs per minute. The RS5 Turbo now has the propulsive power of an express train. The coupe makes the dash to 100 kilometers per hour in 3.9 seconds. Its predecessor needed half a second longer. The turbochargers are located between the V-shaped cylinder banks. It can get pretty hot down there, which is why the setup is called a hot inner V. But the short exhaust gas paths translate into a superior response when you step on the gas. 450 horsepower or 331 kilowatts are a lot of power, just as in the preceding version. But the torque has grown by 170 newton meters. In comparison, the engine in the Opel Atom has a total torque of 170. Newton meters. Dedication is often in the detail, and that also applies to the new Audi. The performance coupe is a real looker, and you can have plenty of fun pushing up the pace. Typically for Audi, the interior is uncluttered, with no profusion of knobs scattered around the place. Everything has its proper place here. The dashboard is optionally available with carbon fiber finishing, combined with lots of leather and Alcantara. The leather sports seats are optionally available with honeycomb stitching. The RS5 has been transformed from beefy tough guy to long distance GT, with prices in Germany starting at just under 81,000 euros. It costs about 3,000 more than its predecessor. The official fuel economy is 8.7 liters for 100 kilometers, but not if you call up maximum output. Its biggest rivals are the BMW M4 and the Mercedes AMG C63. The AMG is the only one with eight cylinders. The Mazda MX-5 has had an enthusiastic following of fans for more than a quarter of a century. Until now, the little convertible's trademark has been its soft top, which can be closed and opened while driving and folds away nicely and tidily behind the driver. Now Mazda has released a different design, the RF retractable fastback. The soft top has made way for a metal roof that can be quickly folded back, turning the MX-5 into a target top, says car tester Ronnie. Let's see what advantages and disadvantages the new design entails.
The soft top Roadster, which remains in production, offers a choice of two gasoline engines, but the fastback comes only with the most powerful of them. It produces 118 kilowatts of power and launches the car from 0 to 100 in 7.5 seconds. Ronnie says the engine doesn't reach its maximum of 200 newton meters until you reach 4,600 RPM. So you have to break the habit of driving at low revs. After all, this is a naturally aspirated engine, not a turbo, which would provide top torque at just 1,400 or 1,500 RPM. So with the RF, get used to driving with plenty of revs, and you'll have plenty of fun. And this is what the beating heart under the hood looks like. A two liter direct injection gasoline engine. Our model has a sport suspension with Bielstein shock absorbers as part of a special optional package costing another 1,800 euros in Germany. In front and below the shoulder line, the new MX-5 RF looks like the old MX-5. The changes are above that line. The roof fins give the fastback its sporty, Targa-like look. They remain in place even when the front and middle sections of the three-part roof disappear completely behind the seats at the touch of a button. The RF is the first Mazda model to feature the power retractable roof. It takes about 13 seconds for the various elements of the roof to fold up or down in an elegant piece of choreography. The driver can follow the little ballet performance on a display. Too bad the depiction of the car doesn't reflect the real car's color. Rear-wheel drive, ideal 50-50 weight distribution between front and back, and a low center of gravity make this car fun even on country roads. We're driving the version with a six-speed manual transmission, but for 1,900 euros more, you can get a six-speed automatic. The RF has kept its soft top brother short, crisp gear throws, and with it, that roadster feeling. The roof can be retracted while you're driving, but it works only at speeds up to 10 kilometers an hour, so enjoy the view at your leisure, says Ronnie, before it gets dark and as long as no one behind you gets too impatient. So would Ronnie prefer the soft top roadster or the fastback with a retractable metal roof? The MX-5 RF is a purest car, says Ronnie. No question about it, but it is clearly more comfortable than the soft top. Maybe you can't go for broke in the curves like in the Roadster, but it has another appealing quality. The metal roof means the RF is better insulated. So it's superior to the MX-5 for driving in winter. In Germany, the RF costs 2,700 euros more than the soft top Roadster. Not too bad for extra all-weather pleasure. <music> Renault is expanding its SUV range with a new addition of the Kaleos. Billing it as a high-end mid-size machine positioned above the 22 centimeter shorter Kajar. Among the highlights are variable all-wheel drive, modern driver assists, and as standard, an online multimedia system. Nissan presents the facelifted X-Trail. In 2016, it was the world's most popular SUV, shifting around 766,000 units. 
As of 2018, the X-Trail will also feature autonomous driving technology. Pro Pilot takes charge of steering, accelerating and braking during single lane driving on the highway. Vans may not be the most exciting things on the road, admits our car reviewer Matis, but reviewing this new MANTGE right here could be rather interesting. Why? Someone has loaded 15 sacks of playground sand inside, and now Matis is supposed to do a test drive. <laughs> he hopes he can jettison it at some point. Locked and loaded, the MAN-TGE handles those 400 kilos easy as pie with its 2-liter diesel engine. It comes in four output levels, ranging between 75 and 130 kilowatts. We checked out the second most powerful unit with 103 kilowatts. Officially, fuel consumption is rated at 7.4 liters for 100 kilometers. Matas reckons the van could have used longer gear ratios, especially for the higher gears. Doing 120 kilometers per hour on the Autobahn, you really hear the engine plugging away in the mid-revs range. With longer gear ratios, it would be less intrusive. The TGE comes with front, rear, and all-wheel drive, but the 4x4 version is only available in combination with the two biggest engines. <laughs> On bumpy roads like this one, says Matas, you appreciate the suspension seat. It costs extra, but it's <laughs> entertaining. <laughs> Whatever you need your van for, the TGE has versions for every purpose. Panel van, single cabin, crew cab, or combi van. You can have a regular, high, or extra high roof. And the van comes in a range of lengths. The permutations are endless. We're testing the long version of the panel van with a high roof. It's just over six meters 80 long and nearly two meters 60 tall placing it in the medium size range. The cargo section has a 14 cubic meter capacity and a payload of over 1.3 tons. And if that's not enough, the trailer hitch can pull another three tons. As to be expected from a van, the interior is a no frills affair but not a loveless one. The materials are more than decent, as is the workmanship. In similar style to a car, there are buttons on the steering wheel to operate the radio and sat nav. A pleasant touch, and a practical one for delivering cargo, is the array of stowage compartments. The MANTGE is big on space and big on safety. It comes with adaptive cruise control, an emergency brake assist, automatic high beams, and an active lane assist. The entry price in Germany is 32,000 euros. Ah, Meanwhile, Matus has finally found somewhere to dump the sand, but he can't believe it. He's at a playground, but there's no sandbox. He's evidently stuck with that load in the back. Then again, the TGE has so much space that he has no problem leaving the sacks on board for the time being. Just a few weeks after presenting its new 5 Series generation reports our car tester Emanuel, BMW has added another model, a plug-in hybrid. The 530E produces 185 kilowatts and can go 50 kilometers on its battery alone. The plug-in's top speed is 235 kilometers per hour, but at that speed, of course, you won't meet the car maker's stated fuel consumption of 1.9 liters per 100 kilometers.
Emmanuel says the electric motor and the gasoline engine together provide the same power as in the 530i, and so you get the same acceleration of 0 to 100 in 6.2 seconds. And the battery alone will move the car at 140 kilometers an hour, except you won't get very far. After all, 9.2 kilowatts isn't that much. From the outside, the hybrid looks hardly any different from its conventionally powered brothers. Blue accents in the kidneys brand this vehicle as a plug-in. And of course, the model's full name on the rear also indicates that this is an electric vehicle. The interior has the elegance and luxury that people expect from BMW. The 530E's battery can be charged via a cable from a household power outlet or a charging station. But starting in 2018, a simpler method will be available. External cameras will guide the car to park over an inductive plate for wireless charging. Current flows through the primary coil in the plate on the ground. A secondary coil will be installed in the car's underbody. The primary coil produces a magnetic field that inductively charges the car's coil with up to 3.2 kilowatts of electric energy. This is the same technology already in use with smartphones and now being tested in buses. The BMW 530e is the sixth member of the 5 Series. Like the other models, all kinds of safety and assist systems are potentially available. And the 530e drives like the other cars in the series while using less fuel. The trade-off? The trunk holds 410 liters, quite a bit less than the 530 liters the others provide. As Immanuel demonstrates, the battery is placed under the back seats, and you see the result when you look in the trunk. Ah, uh, Mattis has shown up and is still looking to get rid of those sacks of sand. Can Immanuel use them? But Immanuel says the days are long gone when people put ballast in the trunk to provide more traction. <laughs> Tough luck, Mattis. The battery and the regular engine are accompanied by a standard 8-speed Steptronic transmission and rear-wheel drive. The electric motor is located in front of the transmission and uses its gear ratios too. This makes a torque converter unnecessary, which compensates for much of the electric motor's extra weight. Immanuel says the 530e costs between two and 7,000 euros more than the 530i, or the 520d. But it also has better fuel economy than the gasoline-only model and is faster and quieter than the diesel. And a purely electric range of 50 kilometers is nothing to sneeze at. So the 530e is definitely worth considering, especially for commuters who don't travel beyond that radius and can charge their battery at reasonable cost. The basic price for the BMW 530e in Germany is just under 54,000 euros. A blast from the past. The Hansa 1100 was an unsung trendsetter. In 1957, Borgward & Co's compact sedan helped to redefine the lower mid-range segment. As West Germany's economic miracle took off, the growing middle class began to assert their individuality and look for a car to express it. As car tester Christoph tells us, the Hansa 1100 was debuted at the Geneva Motor Show in March 1957, still bearing the name Goliath 1100. Goliath was a maker of three-wheeler pickups and small trucks. At the time, entrepreneur Karl Borgvard had bought up four car makers, Hansa, Goliath, Borgvard, and Lloyd. 
Borgvard had founded the Goliath car maker in 1928. Back then, minimalist three-wheelers were in big demand, partly because no driver's license was required for vehicles with engines smaller than 200 cc and three or fewer wheels. Goliath stuck with its three wheels and loud, stinky, gas-guzzling two-stroke engines into the post-war era, building compact vans and pickups like this F400. Christoph sees no relation between those rattling three-wheelers and the sleek compact sedan. And indeed, the 1100 had precious little to do with the long-standing Goliath qualities. It was powered by a newly designed four-stroke, four-cylinder engine. But even the otherwise inflexible Karl Borgvard realized that the persisting image problem could hurt sales. So he revived the Hansa brand, which had been part of his group before the Second World War. And so, in 1958, the Goliath 1100 became the Hansa 1100. Our nearly 60-year-old test car has started rattling a little, but in its day, the Hansa was state-of-the-art. The fully synchronized four-speed transmission was gentle enough for the most delicate hands. In 1960, the antiquated dash-mounted gear shift was replaced with a steering column-mounted lever. The semi-automatic saxo mat could be ordered as an extra. The clutch pedal was now redundant. A touch of the gear shift was enough to disengage and re-engage the gears. Christoph finds the position of the engine especially interesting. It's crouched down in front of the front axle, pressing the front wheels firmly down, making for impressive road holding qualities. It flies as straight as a dart along the Autobahn with its 55 horsepower engine, reaching speeds of 135 kilometers per hour. Christoph likes the hint of sportiness and the attention to safety. They may not have had all the airbags we have protecting us today, but at least they had foam rubber along the dashboard, for instance, and in the roof and the pillars. In terms of design, the Hansa 1100 is a typical product of the 1950s, with the rounded contours and flat sides of the envelope or ponton styling of that time. Obligatory were the tail fins with integrated tail lights. That was a trend that came over to Europe from the United States. On the whole, Christoph thinks the Hansa 1100 is a really smart mid-sized car. Also, alles im allen muss man sagen, der Hansa 1100 wirklich ein super schicker Mittelklasse Wagen. Extroverted car buyers could even order a luxury version. It featured a two-tone paint job and more chrome than the basic 1100. The most popular version was this two-door sedan. The station wagon and coupe with flattened roofs are absolute rarities now. For a lower mid-range car, the Hansa offered an excellent range of equipment with glove compartment and ashtray standard. Christoph is actually impressed with the Hansa 1100's engine, the four-cylinder boxer unit with a 1.1-liter capacity and 40 horsepower. A more highly compressed version with two carburetors even managed 55 horsepower. Quite an achievement for such a small capacity. In comparison, the VW Beetle of that time, with its 34 horsepower, just crawled along the road. The Beetle's own boxer engine was air-cooled, but the Hansa 1100's was water-cooled, which made it noticeably quieter. It received much praise for its smooth operation and flexibility. About 44,000 Hansa 1100s found buyers, but that still wasn't enough to cover the high development and production costs. In 1961, the Borgvard Group filed for bankruptcy, and production of the smart, mid-range car came to an end.
Kristoff speculates that with its relatively luxurious features, high safety standards, and advanced technology, the Hansa 1100 would very likely have still been going strong today. After all, individuality still counts, and there's always demand for a niche market. In Borgvard's day, that wasn't always the case, but as a precursor to exclusive but smaller mid-range cars for demanding buyers, the Hansa 1100 is definitely a milestone of automotive history. And next time on Drive It, a flagship with new engines, the Mercedes S-Class. And we test Hyundai's Ionic Hybrid.